Hi, my name is Bridget Graff, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Slow Food Atlanta chapter, of which Miller Union executive chef and co-owner Stephen Satterfield is the co-vice president, and you'll be hearing from him shortly. Our chapter has an intentional focus on the fair aspect of Slow Food's good, clean, and fair food for all mission, and for good reason. According to Wholesome Wave Georgia's 2020 report, out of 1.38 million food insecure Georgians, 12% reported not having enough to eat as a result of COVID-19. And we know that Black and Hispanic households were twice as likely as white households to be struggling with food access in 2020. Because of these needs in our community, we focus a lot of our energy supporting our food justice initiatives to help these underserved populations in Atlanta. Whether that's partnering with Wholesome Wave or HBCUs in Atlanta, we strive to achieve good, clean, and fair food for everyone in our city. I think you'll see that both Stevens obviously have a lot in common, including their emphasis on food justice, and I think you'll really enjoy their conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Steven Satterfield and Steven Satterfield. Uh, my name is Bilal. Uh, I'm a board member for Slow Food USA. And I'm here with Steven Satterfield and Steven Satterfield. Wait a minute, what? That's <laughs> true. That's right. Uh, tell me a little bit about your names. Has there been confusion around that? Why don't you start? Uh, to say confusion around our names and who we are is an understatement. Um, but first, let me introduce who I call the other Steven Satterfield. Yes. Um, and, and you're an Atlanta native, uh, fourth generation, mm -hmm. and um, you're, you've worked in the food space in many different forms. So I, I can understand why it might be confusing for some. Um, yeah, I have had a lot of people reach out to me and say, oh, wow, you're a chef and you also have Whetstone magazine. No, that's not me, but I can send an introduction if you like. Uh, and then, yeah, I it's, mean. It's so deep, though. I mean, like, uh, the restaurant confusion yes. doesn't just extend between people thinking that I have a restaurant, which I don't. Yes. It is reservations for restaurants. Yes. Like our friend Stuart Brioza in San Francisco, who texts you and says your table at State Bird Provisions is ready. Yes, right. I think it was probably an automated text. <laughs> exactly, However, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and I'm sure he didn't make the reservation. However. It's true. We were both in the system, so you know, somebody makes a, maybe probably called and made a reservation and then they just keyed in the wrong it's, Steven Satterfield, which is easy to do. Um, yeah, and also you have an incredible show on Netflix right now called High on the Hog. Thank you. Um, it's absolutely beautiful and stunning and a story that needs to be told. Um, Thank you. And I want you to talk about that some more too. But um, you've also done work with promoting South African wineries and you were a restaurant manager in San Francisco for some time. Yeah. Um, you spend a little time in Eugene, Oregon. This is all true. Yeah. You did your homework. It's true. Uh, and oh, I was curious how, I mean, High on the Hog surely is up for some awards, right? Um, it might be. Not that I'm aware of, but I really try to not um, keep tabs on that. Okay. Sort of thing. Award season's around the corner. We'll wait and see. Sure, yeah. Um, well, thank you for that uh, introduction. <laughs> um, I was thinking of how I should try and introduce you. And I, what I learned as I read through your bio is that the restaurant thing is really like a second act for you. Like, this isn't even really your real gift to the world necessarily. <laughs> that at your core, you are a musician, that you are a vocalist and a guitarist who had uh, a very successful career way before food even came on the scene. So what I love about you, especially as a Steven Satterfield, is that you are a unique talent and that your artistry moves across mediums. 
and you already had a career as a artist uh, in music, and now we get to enjoy your art in the culinary realm. And so, yeah, I want to know when are we getting the Sealy reunion, <laughs> first of all, and um, maybe we can talk about that. And yeah, I'm also just like, I think, I guess just to tie a bow on this before we move into more substantive things, um, I am obviously amused that we have this coincidence of the same name and that it has been um, such an ongoing part of both of our lives for so long. Yeah. Um, but I'm also really delighted that it's you that I share the same name with because I have a huge amount of respect for you. And I, um, and please let the people know this is true. I don't tell me if I'm not because I consider myself to be one of your best customers. Oh yeah, definitely. So if I'm not, just let me go on thinking that because <laughs> this is my favorite restaurant in Atlanta. It has long been my favorite restaurant in Atlanta. I'm long on the record of saying that, and the consistency over a decade is remarkable and astonishing for any restaurateur anywhere by any metric. And so here to support Slow Food, but also here to support you as my namesake and appreciation for all you do. Wow, that's really um, a better introduction than what I gave you. But. It's just, it's a dialogue. <laughs> we're, we're in conversation. No, well, and we are here at Miller Union, which is my restaurant um, as the backdrop. Um, and the two of us have wanted to find some way to intersect publicly for quite some time, but we've never found the right, the right thing that felt authentic enough. And then when Slow Food reached out to us to do this um, together, we felt like, okay, this is the one. This is, this is like, this is the, the moment where we can set the record straight, yeah. but also um, really uh, celebrate each other and, and the work that we have done. We, I think we both kind of dabble in a lot of things and that's maybe a Satterfield trait. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But, so I'm glad we got a chance to talk a bit about your work and your careers. And we're here today to talk about slow food, which is about good, clean, and fair. And I'm curious, what does good, clean, and fair mean to you, and how does your work support that? You want to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, I mean, slow food's mantra, good, clean, and fair, is something that I try to live by, both personally and professionally. Um, Starting with the good, I mean, so much of what's good about Atlanta and this region is the growing community here. Um, we have so many incredible opportunities for fresh produce, locally produced grains and flowers, cheeses, um, sustainably raised animals for eating. Um, we really have a 12 month growing season at this point. Thank you, climate change. Thank you. And um, it's just astonishing to see <clears throat> the resources that are available. I think that's definitely the good mm -hmm. and somewhat the clean. Um, fair, you know, it's a little trickier because when you buy everything locally or organically produced, it can be a little more expensive. Um, the fair part in that, in my mind, is that at least we're supporting kind of a closed loop system where it's part of the community and the local economy. Um, and also it's, you know, we're, when we're buying from the local farms, we're supporting their lifestyle and their livelihood and, and, and we're not shipping food across a unpredictable supply chain. Um, but I also think there are other things happening here in Atlanta that um, support the fair. And, and one of the things you and I were talking about earlier is um, we do, we've done a lot of um, 
events that support a Wholesome Wave Georgia, and, and I love all the work that they do. And in particular, with the farmers markets um, offering that um, double SNAP benefit for people that are on EBT, um, it's really a great opportunity for folks that maybe can't afford those things to, to have a much greater access at half the price. And, um, you know, that's something that as a charity that I've, I've been really um, supportive of. And at our 10 year anniversary for the restaurant, we did all of our proceeds went to Wholesome Wave. Um, I always feel like I'm good at deflecting and I like to um, shine the light on others. And, and I think that's one that's very admirable, that's easy to, to shine on. And, and it's a great partner with Slow Food. Um, also being on the board of Slow Food Atlanta, we do a lot of work in the social justice realm around food, and we have a whole um, committee that focuses on that. Um, in particular, one of our board members, Brittany Lemon, who does incredible work um, in the Atlanta area with um, supporting uh, locally owned uh, black businesses and uh, areas in our city that are underserved, that she does some really incredible work with the board. That's great, thank you. It's amazing work. And what are your thoughts on good, clean, and fair? Um, well, I think um, as far as how our work supports it, um, I run a media company. Um, we focus on food origins um, as a means of cultural reclamation. Um, and as a means of uh, exploring one's own identity. And how um, does good, clean, and fair show up in my work? Honestly, I, I'm not positive if I can articulate that explicitly, but what I can say is that my own personal ideology, which led me to form first a magazine and a media company that was fundamentally about place, about agriculture, um, is part of an ideology that deeply influenced my thinking and was brought to me as a young person uh, in the world of culinary arts um, by Slow Foods. You know, um, as a member in Portland, Oregon in 2004, I think is the first time I joined. And so this was already, you know, three decades into the <clears throat> back to the land, in quotation marks, movement um, in, in Berkeley, uh, which, you know, with Alice Water, of course, Waters and Chez Panisse. Um, but there was a similar thing happening um, in, in Portland at the time as well, in the early 70s. And the restaurant that I sort of got my start in was called Genoa. Um, it was also founded in 1971, just like Chez Panisse. And the founders and chefs of that restaurant were deeply engaged and embedded in slow food, um, not just as a organization later on, but as an ideology that not only aligned, but kind of predated the organization in some ways, right? And so I think when we talk about like the, um, the things that slow food has kept at the center, um, good, clean, and fair, um, are almost so steeped in the work that I am doing <laughs> that it's hard to kind of talk about my work in those terms other than to just say our, everything has been colored Mm -hmm. through this sort of lens. So we talk about food justice. Uh, I get the sense from your work that this is a framework that you build off of in your careers, in your daily lives. Uh, and we talked about your global work. We talked about your national work. And I want to get a better sense of place. Uh, right now we're in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we occupy Muscogee Creek land, uh, which is so important to note. But what does place look like for you? What does food justice look like for you here in Atlanta? Um, I can answer. Um, 
I'm a, a child of this city, as is my mom, as is my granny, as is my great granny, you know what I mean? Um, and so being in Atlanta from a perspective of food justice, again, this is ideology that actually came to me from moving to the West Coast as a teenager that I picked up, again, a, a part of my attribution, I'm, I'm gonna say, you know, slow food helped introduce me to a lexicon uh, that I felt innately, right, organically, um, but didn't have the language for until being a part of this community, right? And so when I was met with the language that met my belief system, it was easy for me to be all in. What is the belief system? I actually do believe that everyone does have the right to healthy food. I actually have always believed that. I believe that in a cellular way, right? Um, I believe that we should give away food as an aspiration, right? So. When we're talking about justice, justice means that equality is different for everyone. I'm gonna say that again. Justice means that equality is different for everyone. Because we're not all starting off from the same position. Mm -hmm. And what we're actually going for is justice. This is where the word fair comes up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Atlanta, when I'm here, and mind you, I, even as a, as a son, I have spent the majority of my adult life outside of the city coming back as a visitor to eat at Miller Union. <laughs> um, and only now I'm really kind of aligning my own career and my own timing um, into a sense of responsibility that I feel to the city and thinking about what that means to actually show up, you know? I, I'm on that journey, actually. But as a as an intellectual, you know, food justice has been, has colored my career in the same way that justice has for agricultural workers, for wine workers, for black chefs. It doesn't matter because I've always been in pursuit of the need for equality as a prerequisite for a more just environment, right? And, and so, yeah, that's, I have work to do in Atlanta. I'm in process. That's, that's incredible. And I, I love that answer. Like we are all on this journey. No one has figured it out. And yeah, tell, tell me about your journey. Tell me about how you're figuring it out and moving through. Yeah, I mean, so much of my life is spent inside these walls. So I feel a little out of touch with the needs and um, where the needs are in Atlanta. I, I kind of rely on other networks to identify and serve those communities and I just do what I can to contribute. The people from, are already from, on the front lines. Exactly, yeah. because I, I, I mean, like I said, if there's a, a charity event that I can do to help support, I think that's where my work can best um, contribute because of the just the sheer like number of hours that I spend inside of this place, my second home, probably more like my first home. Um, but I mean, I, I guess it's always on my mind and I mean even just like I'm, I'm working on a, a new book and um, you know trying to make recipes that are accessible and, and 
people feel like they want to make, but also like testing and shooting. You know, in a studio, we have all this food left over, and like I'm so grateful for the Free 99 fridge right. program that exists here. Could you that, tell us more about Free 99? Sure. I mean, the what I do know is that it, they are refrigerators that are stationed in, in um, strategic areas to basically offer a free bartering system, somewhat, not even bartering, it's really more of like a little library of fresh food yeah. that can be accessed by anyone. And so um, uh, my culinary assistant um, will take whatever is, you know, left over from our shoots and just fill up one of those fridges. And it's just like, okay, I feel great about that. I hate wasting food. I do a lot of work in the food waste um, spectrum, preventing it and educating people about food waste and the, and the waste stream. So any time I can avoid putting food into waste stream is something that is important to me. But the fact that it can go to people that are in need is even more important. So, I mean, that's my meager contrib contribution. That's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, our our work in slow food is so multifaceted, and once again, we we talk about weaving that thread of equity and justice into everything we do, and even actions like that, like preventing food waste. That that is a big deal. That is not the norm. Sure, and I mean and just you're to challenging toot, that to toot the restaurant's horn a yeah. little more. Um, we have been composting or collecting compost here at this restaurant since the day we opened. We divert food from landfills every single day. I would beg and plead more restaurants to do that because I think restaurants are huge culprits in food going into landfill. And it's something that is easily preventable with a little extra effort, separation of waste, signing up for a compost hauler. We have options here in Atlanta. It's not just one. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's an important thing to think about. Nobody wants to talk about trash, right? But I'm always, th I, I think about trash a lot and I'm also the trash police here. Yeah, <laughs> good. So that's another way that we contribute. It doesn't necessarily feed people in need, but it, def it definitely keeps our environment a little healthier mm -hmm. and it'd be nice if more people participated. Yeah, I hear that. I'm hearing more about how you participate in the community, how are you a part of it. And I'm going to brag on both of you a bit. You, you tour leaders in your communities, uh, both here in Atlanta on a national and even global scale. And I feel like you might have some insights on community building, maybe even some grassroots organizing. Uh, so let's pull it out a bit. Uh, we have a pretty robust chapter network uh, at Slow Food. What advice would you give to a chapter that's just starting out in their community? Where, where would they, what would be step one? Um, well, step one is knowing that uh, the most effective power is decentralized. So the power that um, they're seeking actually exists within their network, you know? It's only as strong as their network is or your network if I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, I, I actually haven't had a lot of experience um, being a part of institutions um, in varying capacities. I went to private school um, and I had enough after that. But one thing that I learned from that experience and from uh, observing and of course inevitably moving through and within institutions is that they are themselves an inevitability, right? Like we can't function without them. We're in too deep. But um, they're, they're, they're made up of people also, so which is part of the dysfunction and part of how we can break it. And so I think, you know, organizations like Slow Food that have 
decentralized networks have outsized potential, right? And that potential, that advice, that catalyst that people are going to be looking outwards for is never out there. It's always between you and your people. So that's the answer. I like that. I think that's a good answer. I think that's a great answer. I love, I mean, it kind of summarizes really how slow food chapters work because it, they completely rely on the human network and the, the grace and gratitude of people, right? Because it's a volunteer situation for most chapters and um, it's out of the kindness of your heart and the, the yearning to create a better or to modify an existing food system to make it better because we've made some wrong turns in the past 50, 60 years. Sure. Safe to say. Um, I could agree with that. <laughs> but I think like, um, you know, being on, on the slow food board here, I have seen some things that have been very successful and, and, you know, and we've had some, some things that didn't work as well. And I, I think some of the, um, successes are having, a you know, longer term plans instead of, instead of just thinking about two, three, six months ahead, thinking mm -hmm. two to three years ahead or decades maybe, or yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to see past five years with, you know, with a volunteer board. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that can be laid down with good intentions that can be, that can be, you know, good plan planning for later. Um, succession planning is really important so that there's no holes in a, in a committee or in a position that, you know, kind of is in charge of certain sectors, uh, you know, because, and, and also doing it in teams instead of just having, you don't just have one person, you need to have like teams and committees because that way life gets busy and the people that have a little more time and energy can hold the reins mm -hmm. and then you jump back in when you, when you're able, you know, we've seen a lot of people that feel like, oh, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm doing you a disservice because I'm not, I'm too busy to help right now. Well, it doesn't mean you have to leave the board. Just like yeah, we, okay. we'll cover for you. Mm -hmm. How long do you think this period will last? And let's come up for air in January, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think um, relying on the, on the local network that already exists and, and summoning people to come to the table and to really participate is, is what I'm hearing from you. And I am reiterating that in different language, but it's, it's the same idea. Um, the networks already exist. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of like, it's kind of like the, the, the web network of mushrooms underground. It's already yeah, there. Right? You just have to yes. just yeah. add a little water yes. <laughs> and give it a little sunlight and then some cool air. And then there you go. It's sprung up everywhere. Exact. Yeah. Mushrooms yeah. hold the world together. Very true. That it's, could be a whole other conversation. It's <laughs> definitely a documentary. That's amazing. Um, yeah, you just, that was very practical. I'll try to be practical too. Um, so yeah, I think that to add on to what my brother Steven is saying, um, I know like, because the, these are volunteer networks, um, sometimes life gets in the way, right? Um, I think that a, a, sharing, a shared vision is super powerful and um, shouldn't be underestimated, basically. So, you know, of course, Slow Food has a overarching mission and vision, but I think the needs of each community are, are really different. You know what I mean? And so, first of all, like asking yourselves, what am I doing here? It's probably a really good question. Doing a, some internal alignment, making sure that that's all pure and good and checks out. And the answer to those questions are probably going to be about what is ailing your community? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? And this is a response to that. 
And what happens with these uh, sort of loose affiliations is, as I say, life gets in the way and you lose momentum because all of the momentum comes from good intentions. And good intentions versus life is no match. You will lose to life. Hmm. You will lose. And you need something more powerful than good intentions. You need a shared, a shared vision. Yeah. This is what you're talking about. Yeah. To where the, our, our shared vision isn't reliant on my good intentions or my availability, because life is gonna overwhelm me. But since we all know what the other one is here for and what we're trying to accomplish, if I have to tap out, the work happens. And so any network where progress depends on one person or any is no network at all. And any network uh, in which there is no shared vision is a frenetic network, you know? And so I think like more practically speaking, I know I gave some esoteric advice, <laughs> but more practically, um, aligning around a shared vision that addresses local needs with a pure heart after careful internal analysis is some specific advice that I could give. I appreciate that. I appreciate you both for that advice. Uh, we're winding down. We're toward the end of our conversation today. Uh, I feel that it's necessary to mention that this has been a difficult few years for us in terms of the health of this country and this globe with uh, the pandemic that is ongoing. And we're still working through that. Uh, we're still trying to figure out next steps. And my question for both of you is, what are your hopeful next steps for 2022? What's on the horizon for you for next year? Hope to finish my book and turn it in on time to the publisher. Literally that. Um, that's, that's one of them. Um, I hope that people will think about others more and less about themselves, especially when it comes to public health. I, I don't want to get political, but I think it's a really important thing to think of others during this time and it's and and what can we do to help each other and that can be multi-layered in so many ways um and yeah i think um we're all ready for community to come back together and for for people to feel like they can safely gather because it's important to the human heart Mm -hmm. and the soul to, to be able to do that. And maybe you know, even better than before. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. I think much more appreciated. And, you know, and we're seeing that here in the restaurant um, to an extent. But, you know, there's COVID looming in the background. And that's something that we all have to pay attention to and participate in and hopefully, you know, do the right thing to protect each other. Since you brought up the pandemic. No, that's, that, that, that's honestly a word. I mean, seriously. Um, as is turning in that book on time. So that's the gospel for me too. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm big on, on minding my own business is the truth. You know what I mean? I like to mind my business. And um, I know that can sound antithetical to everything that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, I'm really big on putting on the, the oxygen mask first, securing yourself first. And, you know, from our small perch in the world, um, we are building a very potent global community of journalists, of creatives, of thinkers who are busy remaking uh, 
a, a future world that we want to be in and we want to be a part of and we want to be in the forefront of. And for us, that looks like media and storytelling. So we're launching a, a podcast network next month, um, which will be the month of December. And so we have scores of new shows that will be broadcast from all over the world. We have a lot of video projects we're working on. We're going to continue to publish the best in class print magazine on food. Um, and that's what it looks like when I mind my business. You know, that's how I can um, benefit the world is, is by facilitating this essential creative work um, from the people who in my absence perhaps would have a harder time finding that microphone or that amplification. That's what it looks like when I mind my business. So I think for people who are already um, kind of indoctrinated on the side of good, I'm just gonna name it, like I, it really is that binary to me, sorry. Um, Cause we need y'all, we need people who are invested to be in the business of good, like for real, whatever that looks like for you. Mm -hmm. We know what that looks like for Miller Union. We see that. We need you to keep doing that. You know what I mean? That and like, I know that you get caught in the four walls and you shouldn't actually, and I'm not letting you off the hook either, but I'm just saying that you shouldn't actually be asked to necessarily do that. You should be asked to be in community and as a community member, understand the needs of your community members and how your skills can best serve the community so that you can mind your business. Yeah. Because staying open in a pandemic is no joke. Right. And the labor market is... It's no joke. <laughs> That's why we I'm already here know. all the time. <laughs> we already know. So, you know, uh, again, maybe counterintuitive, but next year I'm going to just be minding my business and I'm going to look for um, other people who are on the side of good, who are minding their business, and then I'm going to see what kind of business we can get into together. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Uh, before we wrap up, though, we have to eat some of this. I was ready because I've been hearing about this. Broccoli, fialora, uh leaves from Bartram Trail Farm. These are part of the Arc of Taste. Okay. Arc and you can eat everything like the start with the stem. The stem, okay. lead with the stem. Too late. It's tender, oh, wow. juicy, sweet, crunchy. So much better than like celery. Because yeah. it's not vegetal. It's just crispy. And sweet. And very sweet. Very sweet. Wow, it's super good. The frost definitely hit this. The this frost, nice. that's the thing. Breaks down those starches into sugar. Wow, this is excellent. So, you're cooking with this right now? We just got it in. I haven't even done anything with it yet. I don't even want to cook it. I was about to say. Yeah, maybe. It's good. I'm going to put it on the crudite plate. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, Steven Satterfield, Steven Satterfield, thank yes. you so much for this conversation. And yeah, I can't wait to see what 2022 brings for you. Thank you so much. Thanks Appreciate for having you. us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us. Yeah.